loved the taste of our gummy vitamins, so I decided I'd have more. So I felt like a real person, and it was great. Which I was pretty excited about, you know, being five. Oh, you scared me. It's time for the Apple Seed, an hour that uses the power of great stories to help you make sense of the world and communicate with the people who are important to you. You know, sometimes you just need the words to say some of the biggest things you want to say among those people that you love. And here we give you folk tales and fairy tales and tall tales and personal and family tales to help with that. We believe that great stories can change your family's world. I'm your host, Sam Payne, and I'm excited to be with you today. Today on the show, we've got a couple of stories about new jobs. And it's gotten us here on the Appleseed team thinking about the many jobs we've held <laughs> over the years. And in that vein, we'll bring you a comedic old-time radio adventure about a family man who picks up a new job that ends up shaking up his neighborhood in a way that he never expected. Well, if they don't want to associate with us just because I'm a rent collector, I don't want to associate with them. And that's from the Golden Age radio program, The Life of Riley. And it'll be a fun trip back into the history of radio. And that's coming up this hour as well. Well, let's get started. The first story that we're going to bring you today is called The Bony Fish from storyteller and longtime friend of the show, Kim Whitecamp. It's a story about a young girl finding a first job she loves and the adventure that she has as a result. And as you listen to this story, maybe it'll bring up memories of your own first job. And of course, maybe it'll just bring up fish stories from your own life. Either way, we hope you share the memories brought up by this story with the people you love. Sharing stories like that is a way to bring you closer build a family culture of rich conversation. And that's what we're about. Kim's waiting for us in the Appleseed Performance Studio along with our terrific studio audience. Let's head on over and hear the tale. Thank you. So when I was a little girl, my parents didn't go to the school of the big box stores. When you go there, you see kids that are whining and crying, and their parents say, if you behave, I'll get you this. My parents never said that to us. They said, if you don't behave, you're going to get something. <laughs> And my parents never doled out money. Everywhere I go, different stores and things, I see people just handing their kids cash. My mom and dad never just, they never just handed us cash. My dad had an interesting way of teaching us things. If it was a really good day, if my mom had had a good day, after dinner, we'd get dessert. And most of the time, it was canned peaches in these melan melanine uh, bowls. They were pastel color. And if she was in a really good mood, we got Cool Whip. <laughs> and when she put that dessert in front of all the kids, we weren't allowed to touch it until my dad walked around with his spoon and took one bite out of each of our dishes. And he would say, that's the government. <laughs> So he had a way of teaching us things in a very interesting way. And you never dreamt of asking my dad for money without any good purpose and without ever having to earn it. But there came a time when there was something that I wanted that I thought that my dad would feel good about that he would just kind of give me the cash for it. So I waited for the right timing. First, he came home whistling. That's a good sign. My mom was making his favorite meal, rolled sugared apples with kielbasa. And I thought, oh, he's going to be in a good mood. And tonight's the night I'm going to ask for the cash. So after dinner, my dad had sat back in his chair and the little black and white TV was showing Walter Conkright. And I thought, I'm going to wait till the news is over and then I'm going to ask him. So I sat at the table. And my dad kind of kept eyeing me while the news was playing. And then he said, well, turn that off. And he said, tell me why you're sitting here hanging out with me after dinner. And I said, well, dad, I have something that I want to ask you. And he said, okay. He said, what is it? I said, well, I need some money. Oh, you need some money. All right. What do you need it for? I said, well, Dad, I said, I'm so tired of using my brother's fishing rods when we go fishing. Our family is really big on fishing. And I said, I'm just really tired of using hand-me-down rods, and there's a rod that I want, and if you could just give me the money for it, I would so appreciate it. And he said, you know what? <clears throat> I respect that. 
We love to fish. You should have your own fishing rod. He said, I'll be right back. And he left the table. And I sat there thinking to myself, I can't believe this. My dad is just going to go get the cash and hand it to me. The first kid in the history of our family is just going to be handed some cash. Well, I waited there really excited. And my dad came back and I saw he had something in his hand and my heart was kind of pounding. And I was like, I can't believe this. And I'm going to get to go get my fishing rod. I already had it picked out. And my dad sat down and I saw in his hand was a piece of paper. And he slid it across the table. (laughs) And on that paper were jobs that I could do to earn money. (sighs) I resigned with a sigh. And I said, okay, let me look. So I went down the list and there, number four was a job that I knew I would enjoy. Now, when I threw rocks down into Burke's pond, I got in trouble, especially when I took out a barn window. (laughs) When I threw my little sister around, I would get in trouble. As a kid, when you throw stuff, you get in trouble. But there on that paper was a job where I was going to get paid to throw things. And that's how I got my first newspaper route. (laughs) I loved it. I would wait at the end of the school day. I would go to the end of the driveway and hook my fingers into the twine that held a large stack of newspapers, and I'd drag them into the garage. I'd snip the twine, and then I would take the newspapers, thwap it into my hand, roll it up, and then I had rubber bands down my arms, and I would snap one around each newspaper. And then I'd drop it into a big cloth bag made of canvas. And then there were always a few extra that I would put in the bike basket on my, ba- on my bike. It was made of, it was, I called it plicker. It was plastic wicker. And uh, off I would go into the neighborhood. And I got to whip these things at people's houses. <laughs> the first time I took my route, I was so excited. Top of dog box, left bush front porch, top roof line, side left. I made all of my targets the best that I could, and it was absolutely wonderful. Well, one day when I was riding my bike down uh, to deliver my papers through the neighborhood, and I need to explain this. My neighborhood wasn't like, you know, rows of houses. It was a lot of farmland spread out, but with a lot of relatives that lived there and then some come here's that came later. Well, one day I was riding my bike down through to deliver the papers and it wasn't long after I got the newspaper out. When I got down to Miss Della's house and she came out and she said, stop, stop your bike. I pushed back on the pedals and left a black line on the macadam of the road. And she came out and she said, Kimmy, she said, I'm sick of you throwing that newspaper at my house onto the bushes. She said, from now on, when you come down with the newspaper, you're going to stop and you're going to wait for me. And I'm going to come out and we're going to barter. Oh, I love to barter. She said, I'm going to give you something and you're going to hand me the newspaper. And she was true to her word. Sometimes it was a little baggie full of red cinnamon hearts. Sometimes it was a fresh cut branch of lilac that I would stick into my basket and I could smell it the whole time I rode my bike. And then I'd give it to my mama as a gift. One time she went away and I held her paper for a few days. And when she came back, she gave me a little beaded woman on a, on a rope that she had gotten on a trip that she had flown on an airplane to go on this trip. And I just thought that was the greatest thing that she brought me that back. Everybody loved Miss Della. How could you not love a woman like that? She had cornflower blue eyes and her skin leathered from the sun because she was always outside. She had a large hat that looked like a a flour tortilla met a UFO. (laughs) She always had on a shirt with kids standing around the world, holding hands and wore sandals from the first time the sun peaked through the winter and till the first snowflake fell from the sky. But there was a lot of reasons why we loved her. And, uh, I got a few I'm going to tell you, just because I need to help you understand this sweet woman. So she had gone to veterinarian school, but she only made it halfway through. And she had enough knowledge to make her dangerous. Now, I lived in an area where we had large animal vets come in for cows and horses and things like that, but we didn't have a companion vet, like a small animal vet. So she took that job on herself with half knowledge. (laughs) And... You could take anything there, a cat, a dog, a bird, a chicken, whatever, and she would try and work with it. But her husband, not one to miss an opportunity, became a taxidermist. (laughs) And they put a little wooden burn sign on their door that said, either way, you get your pet back. (laughs) So how can you not love that woman? She had a heart of gold, even though sometimes it went awry. Another reason that we loved her, especially the kids, was because she had a worm farm. She was ahead of her time. Before composting was popular, 
On the left side of her property, right at the line uh, that was invisibly drawn of who owns what, she had all of these wood-stilted plastic bins, and on top were uh, lids with holes. And in those bins, she had compost, and in that compost, she had red wigglers, the best fishing worm you could possibly use. How can you not love somebody that has a worm farm as a kid that's the coolest thing ever? Well, the day came when I had enough money to get my fishing rod. And I told my dad, and he said, okay, I'll take you down to the Kmart. It was a big deal. We had just gotten a Kmart. And my dad came home early from work, got me, put me into the Oldsmobile station wagon, and off we went to the Kmart. And I knew exactly where to go. I went back to the sporting goods area, and I picked up that blue and white Mickey Mouse fishing rod. I paid for it $9.99 in tax. I took it home and I pulled it out of that formed plastic front cover that was hard and peeled off the back cardboard. And I sat that fishing rod in the corner of my bedroom and I waited. Now, my dad's a fine fisherman and you may think that he's the one that's going to take me fishing. Mm -mm. My brothers are good fishermen and you may think that they were the ones that were going to help me break that rod in. No, I was going to wait for my Uncle Howard. My Uncle Howard is the quintessential fisherman in our family. And so my mom put a call out to him that I had a new fishing rod and that I wanted to break it in. Well, sure enough, that Saturday, there was a loud knock on the door. I threw the door open and the smell of vanilla pipe tobacco came through the doorway as he lifted me up and spun me around and said, there's my girl. He said, I heard you got a new fishing rod. I said, yes, I did. He said, you go to your bedroom and get it, okay? I said, okay. Well, I ran back to the bedroom and I got it and I brought it out to him and he held it in his hand. And he said, oh, that's a fine fishing rod. (laughs) He said, go down and get your bait bucket and we're gonna head out. I said, okay. Well, I went down to the basement to get the bait bucket. Now, I don't know how you all do it. How many fishermen? Okay, great. (laughs) I can pretty much say anything and you'll be like, oh yeah. Yeah, I know this. So I went down and got the bait bucket. Now, what we do is we have a bucket that has holes in the bottom. And then there's a rope that we attach to our belt loop on our jeans because then we can put our bait in the bucket and it trails behind us and water flows through and then the bait doesn't die, right? So I went down to get the bucket and I found it and I made sure the rope was attached. And as I was coming up the basement stairs, I heard my mother saying to my uncle Howard, Howard, you better use the fishing rod. And I heard him say, Lenny, that's the whole point of this trip. Of course I'm going to use the fishing rod. As I turned the corner into the living room, my little mama was poking Howard in the chest saying, if I find out you didn't use that fishing rod. Now you may think it's weird that my mom's saying that, but that's because my uncle Howard was the president of the Noodlers Association of America. Now, if you don't know what noodling is or hand fishing, which I don't think you do (laughs) from how far we've gotten about fishing, I'm going to give you a really quick 101 just for you so that you know. Here's how it works. You have a footer and you have a noodler and you got a bunch of guys and a cooler of cold Diet Pepsi. (laughs) Depends on where you live. And... They get in the truck and they go down to where the creek dumps into the river. They get out their gear and they go down to where the creek goes into the river. And there's a plot of land there between trees where it's worn down where my brothers and my fathers and my my father and my brothers and different relatives have fished for a long time. Well, they set up and the noodler and the footer go into the water. Noodler in the front, footer in the back. The other guys sit on shore drinking their cold beverages and waiting. They go in and then the noodler goes underneath the water. He feels around for a hole. Now, if he finds a hole that is round and slick smooth, he doesn't put his hand in because that's a snake hole. But if he finds one that's oval and it has ridges, he doesn't put his hand in that either because that's a snapping turtle hole. But if he finds one that is oval and slick smooth, that's a catfish hole. So when he finds that, he comes up and he tells the footer, I found a catfish hole. Then he goes back underneath the water. He puts his hand in the hole. He moves his hand and it looks like bait. And that catfish comes out of the back of the hole and it chumps down on his hand. 
Then in the back of the throat, there's a bone that feels like a luggage handle. And he hooks his fingers in that and he starts to kick. When he starts to kick, the footer takes his feet, locks them underneath his armpits, grabs his knees and pulls him out. And as that catfish comes out of the hole, he thrusts that noodler's legs forward. They wrap around the fish because if you don't have your legs around the fish, when it comes fully out, it'll turn like an alligator and you'll break your arm. After he's got his legs around that fish, then the footer takes his hands, shoves them underneath his armpits, locks them up and then pulls that noodler and the fish to shore. When they get to shore, the footer then opens the jaws of the catfish. The noodler safely releases his hand, and there's the fish. This is when the guys who have been waiting do their job. They get up. They walk over. They surround the fish, and they go, all right. (laughs) It's a big job. So that's why my mom was telling my Uncle Howard, you better use the fishing rod because she didn't want me noodling. So off we went and we went to Miss Della's to get some bait. When we got to Miss Della's, we didn't even knock because it was early morning. We could tell it was going to be a nice day and we knew she was going to be outside. So we went around the side of the house where the bins were that held the worms and sure enough, there she was. She had the lids off and she had gloves that went up her to her elbows. She had two utility buckets and she was dumping them into each bin and then digging her arms in and pulling up and digging her arms in and pulling up. My Uncle Howard said, Miss Della, what are you doing? She said, well, I made a deal with the little diner up in Locust Grove, and they give me twice a day all of their eggshells and their coffee grounds. She said, it's wonderful. It makes fantastic compost. We walked over, and she looked, and she said, Kimmy, did you get your fishing rod? I said, yes, I did. She goes, girl, Your first round of bait is on me. Why I had my bucket at my side. And they commenced to talking while I started looking for red wigglers. Red wigglers are thick, shiny, flashy, juicy, and wigglers. The perfect thing for the end of a fish hook. Well, I began to dig for some red wigglers. And every time I uncovered some, they'd wiggle down in. And I'd uncover some more and they'd wiggle down in. And finally, almost 11 minutes later, it took me that long just to get a handful of bait and put it in my bucket. Well, we took off. And I was pretty excited about this. We went to where that beautiful worn down piece of land was. And my uncle Howard looked at me and he said, Kimmy, suit up that rod. I got my fishing rod and held the hook in my hand with the rod here, and I reached into the bucket to pull out a worm. But those red wigglers had taken and knotted themselves into a red wiggling ball, and I would pull a worm, and it wouldn't come loose, and I would pull another worm, and it wouldn't come loose. Finally, he looked at me and said, Kimmy, what's taking you so long? I said, I cannot get these worms to come apart that I can pull one, and you don't want to kill them. You want live bait. And he said, give me the bucket. So I handed him the bucket and he put it under his arm and he reached in and he tried to pull a worm and it wouldn't come loose. Then he tried to pull another worm and it wouldn't come loose. And he said, I don't know what is wrong with these worms. He said, you know, they smell funny. I said, what? He said, they smell like something familiar. And then he held the bucket up to his ear, leaned in and listened. And he said, Kimmy, they're making noise. I said, what? He said, they are making noise. And he took the bucket, steadied it on the palm of his hand, leaned it forward and let me listen. I leaned in, took a sniff, turned my ear, and I heard it. Boopy dooby doop boop. (laughs) Boop boopy doop boop. If you're under 30, just ask anyone in here over 30. (laughs) I looked at him and I said, I know that song is from that coffee commercial. He said, yes, it is. He said, I think these worms are juiced up on caffeine. (laughs) He said, they're they're juiced up on caffeine. And no sooner did he say that than that red wiggling ball of worms hit the side of the bucket, tipped it out of his hands. They rolled into the water, went down that river and sunk. And I looked at him and I said, what are we supposed to do? We don't have any bait. And he looked at me and he said, girl, roll up your pants. I rolled up my pants, laid down my fishing rod, and he said, we're going to go noodling. (laughs) 
I was so excited. He said, we're going to keep it small. So we stayed along the shoreline and he felt around and felt around. Then he found a little hole and he said, you know what to do? I said, yes, sir. And I put my hand in and I wiggled and that catfish came up and it chumped onto my fingers and I felt a little bone in the back of its throat and pulled it out of the hole and it hung there. And I said, Uncle Howard, I did it. And he said, let it go. And I released it off of my hand and downstream it went. We did that three times. And he looked at me and he said, are you getting tired of the little ones? I said, yes, sir. He said, okay, do you know what to do? You're going to follow me into the water, okay? And when I find a hole, when I start kicking, you grab my feet. I said, yes, sir. And so we went into the water and the water was bobbing between my lip and my nose and my lip and my nose as I followed in his wake, moving with the water. And then he stopped just as my tiptoes were digging into that wet bottom. And he said, this looks like a good spot. He went underneath the water and it went still. And then all of a sudden he broke surface, flicked his hair in a Bow Derrick move and he said, girl, he said, I found a big old catfish hole here. He said, I heard tell of a catfish here called the undertaker and I think this is its hole. He said, are you ready? I said, yes, sir, I'm ready. He went back underneath the water and I watched the bottom rubber soles of his shoes And then they began to kick furiously. So I grabbed his ankles and I pulled with all the strength I had, locked them underneath my armpits and then felt right below his knees and grabbed on hard. I pulled and I pulled and I pulled and I could see the glinting head of that catfish as it slowly came out of its hole. And then that catfish began to break surface. And before I could release the legs, everything went slow motion like a wild kingdom sponsored by Mutual of Omaha. (laughs) And for a moment I was looking, that catfish, That fish was looking deep into my soul, and I was looking deep into its soul, which I know is theologically incorrect, but it's my story. (laughs) And as it looked at me in that slow motion second, I saw that its eye was rolling around wildly in its head, and I thought, I've seen that look before, when my dad has too much coffee and nothing to eat. And that's when I realized in that split second that that catfish had consumed that double red wiggler (laughs) espresso. And we were the idiot baristas that had served it. I got my wits about me and I shoved his legs forward. He wrapped them around the catfish. And when he did, that catfish came full surface and it shot downstream in a caffeinated jerk. And my uncle Howard had been holding onto that bone handle, legs around that catfish. And when that catfish took off, he lost his grip and his hand went all the way to the back inside tailbone of that catfish. There he was going downstream, legs around that catfish, arm the whole way down inside that catfish, its lips slapping up around his neck. My Uncle Howard had a fish hickey for a week. (laughs) And I even made an album with his story, and his wife still don't believe it. (laughs) Well, I stood there hopeless. I had nothing I could do. He was gone. I didn't even know if he was going to be back. I stood there rocking in the waves of the river. And then I heard it, and then I saw it. My Uncle Howard riding that fish. (laughs) Hey! Help! Help! And on that third time, out of my peripheral vision, I saw my blue and white Mickey Mouse fishing rod and I thought, my time has come. I went back to shore, picked it up, went to where a tree had fell into the water. I wrapped my legs around it, locked tight, and I waited for the exact right moment. Help! And I released that line. Hooked onto his Wrangler belt jeans loop, brought him to a complete dead stop. His arm came flying out of that fish. He was still holding on to the inside. And when he pulled his arm out, he turned that catfish inside out. (laughs) That slick internal tail slipped from his fingers and that catfish went downstream. Bones once on the inside, now on the outside. Its heart hanging off its chest, pumping, pumping, pumping. <laughs> Black eye sockets looking back at me, and its gills opening and closing, winking silver skin that was once on the inside, now on the outside. And then it sunk into the water and disappeared. <sighs> well, I reeled in my Uncle Howard <laughs> and unhooked him, and we went to shore. And we just both plopped down. We were dead tired. And he said, man, girl, that was some fine fishing. Don't 
tell your mama. <laughs> he said, I bet you're tired. I said, yes, sir, I'm tired. He said, well, I'm tired too. I said, I bet you are. I said, that catfish gave you a ride three times. He said, I know how many times it gave me a ride up and down. He said, he said, I bet the fish is tired. It'll never be the same. I said, no, it won't. He said, well, I bet they're tired too. I said, they? Who? He said, the people listening to this story. <laughs> He said, you've been pulling their line for 20 minutes. <laughs> and they bought it hook, line, and sinker. Thank you. <laughs> Great fun in the Appleseed studio with Kim Whitecamp, longtime friend of the show, and of course our terrific studio audience. And Kim may have been pulling our leg with some of the details, red wigglers juiced up on caffeine and all that. But there's still a sweet core to the story. And one thing I love about it is how Kim gets so much support from her community as she starts up her very first job. I'm thinking about Miss Della. Instead of taking Kim to task for her lackluster aim with the newspapers, she takes young Kim under her wing, helps her find a better way to do the job. Do you have a Miss Della in your life, someone who provided you with that kind of help? In just a moment, a little talk back with friends about Kim's story, followed by an old-time radio adventure about a new job gone wrong. You won't want to miss a word. I'm Sam Payne. ago, it was our pleasure to hear in the Appleseed Performance Studio a terrific performance by longtime friend of the show, Kim Whitecamp, a story called The Bony Fish. And boy, was it ever a fish story. <laughs> and I'm thrilled to be joined around the desk by our producers, Dr. Heather Bigley, Dr. Brian Tanner. Guys, thanks for joining me. Hello. Hey. We had this interesting conversation about that story. And, and for all of its tall tale virtues, the thing that we kind of found ourselves talking about was the job yeah. that Kim got that facilitated <laughs> the adventure, right? Yeah, exactly. And that got us talking kind of about our first jobs, stuff uh -huh. like that. Yeah. I just love that she is in such a tiny, small town that the paper can fit in her bike uh, basket <laughs> because my brother had a route yeah. uh, in the suburbs of D.C. delivering the Washington Post, and my husband had a route in the suburbs of Seattle delivering the Seattle Times, and that was not something you could fit in your bike basket. <laughs> it was like an all-family affair. Both my brother and uh, my husband at different times had to have their parents drive them around with the back mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of the car filled to the brim with oh, these yeah. enormous papers wow. and throw them. And it became such that it was like, that's not, it's not worth it, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's not <laughs> worth it to deliver well, papers. I was flashed back to when, when I was a kid and I had some something that I wanted. And I d did the same thing, you know, pitching it to my parents, yeah. like, you know, and in my case, it was a Nintendo entertainment system. Oh, you know, oh the original gosh, 80s gray <laughs> brick of a console. That's yeah. more than $9 in ninety. Yes, it cents. was. It oh was my. At the time, it was about $100. <laughs> and my dad had a very similar reaction, like, that's great. Why don't you do some jobs and get oh, some money? Yeah. So I remember weeding for neighbors and doing extra jobs around the house. It, and for an eight- or nine-year-old me, it took me about a year oh, to gosh. earn up the money. But, man, when I got that thing, I still own it. <laughs> you I still have it? I still have it, yeah. Oh, that's great. And um, I remember I named it Conrad. Um, <laughs> and I used to have— birthday parties for it on yeah. the day when I purchased it. So it was, a, I think the fact that I had to earn the money myself yeah. made it even more meaningful to me. And now that I have a son, he came to me and said, hey, dad, I'd really love to buy a Nintendo Switch Lite. And I was, I flashed back to that and I'm like, that's great. Earn the money. You Why know, to do some jobs. <laughs> and it took him about a year as well to, oh, wow. to do jobs and allowance and what. But but now he has that. And uh, hopefully that he has an appreciation for it too because it took all that hard work to oh, get it. Oh, that's fantastic. Has he named his Nintendo? I, not as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thinking about Kim's first job, 
uh, led me to a memory as well. It's today's entry in the Radio Family Journal. The Radio Family Journal with Sam Payne. A tiny little story for you and your family. Right when you need it. On the Appleseed. It's not that it was my first job. I had worked a very brief stint behind a sandwich counter a few years before and worked through a spring and summer on a landscaping crew when I was in high school. But when people ask me if I ever had a summer job as a kid, my head is filled with memories of my white-collar gig working for R.J. Ellis and Associates, a firm owned and run by my neighbor. R.J. Ellis called itself an investment firm, but... Whatever. What they really did was bought and sold rare coins exclusively. That's what they did. What did I do at the firm? Well, in the days before the internet, the guys at R.J. Ellis would assemble a national rare coin auction each week. They'd send out an ad to the handful of national numismatics publications like Coin World, and then people from all over the country would call in on Wednesdays to bid on coins. And it was all kept track of on a big whiteboard in the conference room. And my job was to get all the information ready for the ad, and when it was all over, I'd go in and tally up who had won which coins in the auction. And I'd make up receipts, and I'd bundle up the coins, and I'd drive to the post office, and I'd send the coins out to the winners. And I'd take out the trash, too. Maybe you don't think that sounds like a very exciting job, but the truth is, I really loved it. And what I loved best was learning about coins, these beautiful little pieces of sculpture carried around in everyone's pockets all the time, at least back then. And I didn't really have any money to speak of, but in those auctions, sometimes I'd bid on something inexpensive myself. And I still have those few coin purchases tucked away in a box of treasures from my childhood. I learned about the oxidization that can turn a coin a gentle shade of blue or red or yellow. Toning, they called it. And I bought a gently blue-toned nickel in one of those auctions for about four bucks. And I learned that my favorite image on a half-dollar coin was the image of Ben Franklin on half dollars between 1947 and 1963. So I bought one of those, too. And beginning in 1964, Franklin was replaced on the half-dollar by John F. Kennedy. It was the year after he was assassinated, after all. And I thought that because that was historic, I might as well get a Kennedy half, too. And I got a 1972 Eisenhower dollar because on the back of that coin is a tribute to the Apollo 11 moon landing. Behind the eagle on the back of the coin, you can see the surface of the moon and the earth in the distance. And I learned how to tell which mint struck a particular coin, whether it was minted in San Francisco or Denver or Philadelphia or West Point. And I had a copy of that year's Red Book, the Bible for coin collectors from the American Numismatics Association, the ANA. And I knew the difference between the American Numismatics Association and the American American Numismatics Association Certification Service, which doesn't exist anymore because it was sold to Coin World in 1989 and then resold. Anyway, the point is, I knew a few things. And if the question is, how useful was that knowledge in my college life and then my life after college? The answer is, not very. But then, maybe a decade later, in the late 90s, my mom married my stepdad. That was big. My stepdad was a wonderful guy, but we had nothing in common. I had been an English major. He was a math professor. And there's this tricky time when someone comes into your life in an important way, and you're trying to figure out just how to get to know each other. And maybe you know what that's like. If you do, if you know what that's like from your own experience, you can imagine what a gift it was for me to be at my folks' house one day and to see on my stepdad's bookshelf an old copy of the American Numismatics Association Red Book. And that led to a conversation in which I learned that Dennis, my stepdad, had collected coins since he was a kid in Texas. He had Franklin halves and Kennedy halves and knew the difference between the ANA and the ANACS and had even subscribed to Coin World. It was miraculous. It may not seem miraculous, but... It was miraculous. And figuring out how to get to know each other wasn't something that made me nervous anymore. I was thankful for that job when I had it. 
And I have a lot of fond memories of that gig at the coin place, just because it was, you know, kind of awesome. But the gift it gave me of the connection with Dennis, my stepdad, I'll never know how to be thankful enough for that. The Radio Family Journal of Sam Payne. A tiny little story for you and your family. Right when you need it, on the Appleseed. Thanks for joining us for that entry in the Radio Family Journal. We always hope these stories bring up memories and thoughts for you that you can share with the people that you love. And, of course, if that happens, you can reach out to us as well. We love to hear your stories. Send them to us at theappleseed at byu.edu. There's a lot more coming up, including an old-time radio adventure about a family man who takes on a new job and winds up turning his whole neighborhood upside down. That's coming up. I'm Sam Payne. The early days of television are full of hit shows like Father Knows Best, Dragnet, The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. Those are all shows that started out as radio shows and then made the leap to the small screen. And today on The Appleseed, we're going to bring you a taste of another show that did the same thing. And it's maybe one you haven't heard of, but you'll be glad you did. The Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as Riley. The Life of Riley. It had quite a few incarnations over its lifetime as a show. It began as a radio program taped before a live audience for, oh, seven years, between 1944 and 1951. And then it was adapted into a movie in 1949. And then it was made into two different TV shows, lasting a total of seven seasons. And it was even made into a comic book in 1958. The show stars William Bendix as Chester A. Riley, better known as just plain old Riley. He's kind of a salt-of-the-earth factory worker from Brooklyn. And like many sitcom dads that would follow in the wake of shows like The Life of Riley, Riley is a bit bumbling and slow, but he's got a good heart and his decency wins out at the end of the day, or tends to. Paula Winslow plays Riley's long-suffering wife, Peg, and her voice might be a little bit familiar to you, especially if you've seen the movie Bambi. She plays the voice of Bambi's mother, and she also plays Jane, the mom on The Jetsons. Remember that cartoon? And rounding out the cast is a guy named John Brown, a British actor who here puts on a thick Brooklyn accent to play Gillis. Riley's best friend and occasional frenemy. That was a thing way back in 1944. Part of what audiences loved about the Riley family is that they weren't well off, really. They had relatable money troubles. And as the narrator will inform us this week, we'll get a kind of showdown between Riley and Mr. Dawson, the rent collector. On the first of every month, Chester A. Riley's little stucco bungalow is transformed into a virtually impregnable fortress. For this is the day the rent collector comes for the rent. Riley has mobilized the family and stands ready to repel the enemy from his gates. His wife, Peg, however, seems to be a conscientious objector. Riley, this is absolutely crazy. I know what I'm doing, Peg Jr. Did you nail the front gate? Yeah, Pop. Good. But that won't stop him. He'll jump over it. Well, then he'd have to go through the sprinklers. Junior, did you turn him on? Yes, Pop. Full force? Yep. Great. By the time Dawson gets to the front door, he'll be soaking wet, and I'll keep him out there so long he'll freeze. (laughs) It's a regular obstacle course just to get to the front door. But just wait. Riley's got another trick up his sleeve should Mr. Dawson penetrate his defenses. Come on, Riley. Come on, boy. Uh Well... What are you doing with Mr. Shellmeyer's great day? Laddie is my secret weapon. When I let him loose on Mr. Dawson, he'll never show up here again. Oh, right. You ought to have your head examined. Why, Laddie's the gentlest dog in the world. He wouldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> Oh, 
all the kids in the neighborhood play with him. He couldn't scare anybody. No, he couldn't before, but I've been training him. Well, watch, I'll show you. Now, hold him tight, Junior. Oh, I got him. Uh, gentle, huh? Now, watch. Now, let's say that I'm Dawson, and I come in and I say, I've come for the rent. <laughs> down, laddie. Down, laddie. Take it easy, hold boy. Him, hold him, Junior. Down, 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 laddie. Boy. Now, down, laddie. <laughs> down. Oh. <laughs> How's that for training? The minute he hears the word R-E-N-T, he's a killer. Pop, there's Dawson at the gate. Now, okay, battle stations, everybody. This is it. Oh, Riley, will you let that man in here? No, my head is made up. <laughs> Open this gate, Riley! Don't say a word. He's looking for the latch. He don't know I got it nailed. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb cluck. Yeah, some dumb cluck. He just took out a claw hammer, and he's pulling out the nails. Oh, well, never mind. The sprinkler will stop him. <laughs> Riley, turn off these sprinklers! Yeah, I told you. He didn't want to get wet and spoil that nice suit. Look, look, he's going back to the car. He's going away. He <laughs> is not. He's putting on a raincoat and rubber boots. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. He's cheating. Here he comes. Open up, Riley. I know you're in there. Don't make a sound. Come on, Riley, open up! Don't say a word, he's trying to trap us. Nobody's home! <laughs> he, he's running away, Pop. Uh, what did I tell you? I knew I'd outsmart him. Anybody can be a landlord, but it takes brains to be a tenant. <laughs> oh, did I put one over on him, or did I put one over on him? <laughs> Good morning, Riley. Huh? How did you get in, Dawson? Your back door was wide open. Oh. You sure put one over on him. Yeah, well, okay, Junior, let me hold Laddie now. Okay, Dawson. What do you want? You know what I want. How should I know? I've come for the money. What money? The money you owe. For what? For this month. <laughs> For this month's what? And not only this month, last month's too. <laughs> last month's what? Last month's money. Money for what? <laughs> for living in this house. <laughs> now, stop stalling, Riley. I, I've stood all I'm going to stand from you. Are you going to pay up? Pay what? Okay, Riley, I, I don't like to get tough with people. I was willing to give you a break, but you leave me no alternative. Here. Uh, what's that? An eviction notice. Sorry. <laughs> Good day. Huh? Wait, 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 Mr. Dawson, wait, wait, wait. Don't... Thank you. you. You take care of this. Well, you really did it this time, didn't you? I warned you not to antagonize him, but you wouldn't listen. Oh, you know everything, my big genius. Well, it's not my fault. It would have worked out fine. Only that Clug Dawson was too dumb to say I've come for the rent. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Down, down. Down, laddie. Get off me. Give me one good reason why. Oh, stop it, laddie. Oh, oh, laddie, get down. An eviction notice? Oh, no. Riley, you've really done it this time. But audiences loved Riley's craftiness and his famous phrase, the phrase he'd utter when he got himself into a heap of trouble. What a revolting development this is! <laughs> that became one of the most popular catchphrases of the day. So, back to the story. With the eviction notice in hand, Riley goes to his landlord, Mr. Morris, and pleads for mercy. And it seems that Mr. Morris is in a bit of a jam himself. He suspects that his rent collector, Mr. Dawson, has been racking up bogus charges on his expense account. After all, he was charging Mr. Morris for such ridiculous items as a claw hammer and some rain gear. So Mr. Dawson has been fired. And who will collect the rent now? Well, wait a minute, says Mr. Morris. Riley is pretty popular with his neighbors, right? Maybe Riley could use his friendships with the other tenants to do the rent-collecting job. Well, Mr. Morris agrees to drop the eviction notice and forget about the missed rent payments if Riley will take the rent-collecting job. Well, Riley enthusiastically agrees. Who wouldn't? And he heads out to collect some rent checks. Oh, come on to the movies. First, got to collect some rent. Morris expects it tomorrow. 
Yeah, I'll go in here and see Gillis. I won't have no trouble with Gillis. Oh, we'll be late. No, it'll only take a minute. Gillis, I can handle. He's my friend, my best friend. What do you want, stranger? Oh, uh, hiya, Jim. I was just going to ring. Don't bother wasting my electricity and get the heck off of my property. Well, Jimmy boy, it's me, Riley boy, your pal. Let me in, will you? Yeah, yeah that's better. Oh, oh and here's Lottie boy. Wait a minute. <laughs> Look, Riley, you want something? Ask for it. If not, blow. I want the money. What money? The money for the... <laughs> I want the money. Money for what? All you gotta do is ask for it. Okay, wise guy, you think you're smart? I will ask for it. I've come for the R-E-N-T. <laughs> Who's been sending his dog to school? <laughs> well, there you have it. Even Riley's best friend, Gillis, has turned on him. And it's not just Riley that's getting the cold shoulder from the neighbors. It's affecting their whole family. They're being uninvited to parties. Friends are pretending to have pneumonia to duck out of a visit with them. And the neighborhood kids have given poor Junior the nickname Stinky, and they refuse to play with him. And the landlord, Mr. Morris, has run out of patience with Riley's inability to collect rent from anyone. And he gives Riley an ultimatum. He has to evict one family by the end of the day. And that thought makes Riley feel sick. But he's in such a financial hole that he feels like he can't refuse. But whom to evict? His best buddy, Gillis, the Richards, who just had a new baby, the Shellmeyers with a new litter of puppies. Well, Riley has a tough choice to make. He heads off into the night alone to deliver the eviction notice. Peg has been against Riley's rent-collecting job from the start, it should be said, and when word gets back to her that he's going to evict one of their neighbors— she rushes all over town to find him. So let's jump back into the story as Peg finally catches up with Riley after finding out that he has gone through with an eviction. Wait a minute. But look at that. Look at that crowd over there. Oh, they're waiting for you. You better get police protection. Now, Peg, I had to do it, you see. Oh, uh, look at that furniture all over the sidewalk. How would you feel if you came home and found your furniture all over the sidewalk like that? Well, whose furniture do you think it is? <laughs> what? Why, why, Riley, it, it's our furniture. Uh, that's what I was trying to tell you. <laughs> I evicted us. <laughs> but... Digger Odell said that the Shellmeyers Yeah, I were the know, people. but I, I couldn't do it to them. They're our friends. I, I was afraid to tell you, Peg, you see, somebody had to be evicted, and we're the only ones I had the heart to do it to. <laughs> Don't hate me, Peg. I, I know I'm a jerk, but... but uh... You certainly are. You're the sweetest jerk. Oh, Peg. <laughs> when I least expected, you say the nicest things to me. <laughs> I'm so glad you ain't mad. Well, I, I'm not overjoyed at being out on the sidewalk, but what else could you have done? Well, Riley did the noble thing, evicted himself. His moral compass and his marriage are both intact, but what is his family going to do now? Wait, hold on. Is that Riley's old pal, Gillis, coming over? There he is, fellas. Hey, Riley. Now, now, now listen, Gillis. I got enough trouble. Get off my property. I mean, get off my piece of sidewalk. <laughs> Riley, boy, it's me, Jimsy boy, your pal. I got the gang together to help you move the furniture back in the house. Huh? Uh, but, but the eviction... Forget you... it, your rent's paid. When we heard how you took the rap, a bunch of us chipped in and we squared it with Mars. Okay, fellas, lend a hand here with that Oh, gee, fellas, that was... Gee, Peg, did you hear what they... Oh, uh, well, Peg... We got our home back again. I may not be the handsomest husband in the world or the brainiest, but there's one thing you've got to admit. With me, you've got security. At least for the next 30 days. 
And just like that, Gillis and the neighbors come together. It's a wonderful lifestyle to keep Riley and family in their home, and all is well. But that's not quite the end of the story. There are a few loose threads hanging, like who's collecting the rent now that Riley is out of that job, and will Riley be up to his old tricks when the new rent collector comes by? The episode ends with a little tag that wraps those mysteries up. I, uh, I wonder who Morris got to be his new rent collector. Well, what's the difference who it is? We have the rent, thank heaven. Just pay it and don't make any yeah, trouble. I'll pay it. I'll pay it. But first, I'm going to put up a fight. Come in! Hello, Mr. Riley. <laughs> I'm the new rent collector. I've come for your rent. Huh? Oh, yeah. Here it is. It's a pleasure. Thank you. See you the first of next month. Don't be late. (laughs) You certainly put up a big fight. Oh, Riley. Such a character. Sometime soon, when you're sitting down to stream an old favorite family sitcom, you may recognize descendants of Riley, guys who are kind of like that character and may have their roots in the life of Riley, whether it's Phil Dunphy from Modern Family, Tim the Toolman Taylor, even Homer Simpson, those guys who can all be a little bit dopey, but they've got good hearts and they'll do the right thing in the end. That all goes back to those old shows like The Life of Riley. Thanks for joining us for a bit of radio storytelling history on The Appleseed. And before we go, we wanted to say thank you to those of you who have taken the time to send an email to the show or leave us a thoughtful review on your favorite podcast platform. We got a review on Apple Podcasts from a user called My Pancreas. Love that username, by the way. And the review said, These stories keep everyone entertained and happy in the car. From the toddler, the kids, teens, mom, dad, and grandparents. The music is so fun. The voices, the clever new stories and old classics. Loved by my Montessori preschool kids, too, for story time. And I'm telling you, my pancreas, that made our day. Thank you. If you want to send us a note, you can email us at theappleseed at byu.edu. Or if you're listening through a podcast app, rate us. Leave us a little review. It helps people find the show. And who knows, we might just read your comments on the Apple Seat. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU Radio family of programs. And you can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. Seed.